The last of our hip-hop stories from 1989 now on BBC4, a song that shook America and the male-dominated music world with very strong language. All ladies are queens. It's like that. That's my opinion. People will tell you you're never going to make it. It's all male MCs. They're running things right now. She reminded women of their power. I mean, I just wanted to be an 18 year old rapper. Just those words, ladies first, it holds so much power. We had never seen anything like that. It's one of those songs like Aretha Franklin's Respect. It became a rallying cry. It was a call to arms. I wanted to uplift women. This is about showing strength, kicking down a door in a male-dominated world. Some think that we can't flow, can't flow. stereotypes that got to go. Got to go. I'm a mess around and flip the scene into reverse. With what? With a little touch of ladies first. For me, in my heart, it was anthemic. It was made to say, ladies, treat yourself like number one. now is fusing with a lot of other types of music. In 1989, there were songs like N.W.A. Straight Outta Compton, Two Live Crews, Me So Horny, Tone Looks Wild Thing. It was really a, a toxic, masculine atmosphere with little to no elbow room for the ladies to fit in. Ladies have had to just dig and scrape for every sliver of space they have within hip-hop. Women weren't given the same amount of marketing dollars. Budgets for videos were usually less for female rappers. I remember going down to the Jack the Rapper convention. Basically, the assumption was that I was there as hired help, that I was prostitute. <laughs> Labels that won't even have more than one female MC at a time signed. Salt and Pepper was sort of the saucy, sassy, sexy take. And Shantae was like, I'll rip you apart in high style. And Light was just a poetess. It just was female rappers being pitted against one another. It is what it is. Hip hop, among with many other fields, male dominated. You then make a decision how you want to step forward in the belly of the beast among the lions. Queens of civilization are on the mic. The scene is right, the crowd is tight. I expel the whack and those who write. Why? Because I'm led tight. Then Queen Latifah released Ladies First. I just wanted to make music that made women feel like you number one. Ladies First gave a very strong message to white America about black women. Black women were undervalued, underrepresented. This was an eye-opener. Latifah was the first woman in hip-hop that was political. She was an embodiment of who we were. Queen Latifah gives women somewhat of a superhero to look up to, someone to be like, giving yourself permission to be big, to own the room. It had an enormous influence on black women in hip-hop. Miss Lauren Hill certainly carries the torch. I could see a little bit of Latifah from a business standpoint and Nicki Minaj. Queen Latifah, I'm so obsessed with you because she knows what it takes to be a woman in a male-dominated field and to kick ass. You know, I was just a young kid growing up in North New Jersey. I was one of those kids that could literally drift off in some class as I'm writing a poem. Writing poems was how it all started for me. Nikki Giovanni is probably my favorite poet. You were gone like last week's paycheck for this week's bills. And I'm like, damn, damn, I want to be able to write something like that. Ain't that the truth? Octavia Butler is one of my favorite writers. I love to read sci-fi. My parents had books. You got books, books, books. My mother raised us to be very goal-oriented and task-oriented. You set your goals, then you knock those goals out. When I met Queen Latifah, a.k.a. Dana Owens, we met in high school because I met her through her mother, who was my art teacher. I always tell people that woman saved my life. I was a little bit of a knucklehead. One day, I'm walking down the hallway with my 
big radio, my box at the time we called it. I'm blasting Run DMC. And Miss Owens stopped me and said, you gotta be the dumbest motherfucker I've ever met in the school. And I said, damn, Miss so why are you talking to me like this? She said, you're probably the smartest student in the school, but you wanna waste it. She basically came to my house that night, met my mom and asked her, can she make sure that I stayed on a straight and narrow? And that, that was the beginning of our relationship. Well, my father, on the other hand, he was a SWAT guy. So he was teaching me how to shoot a gun, how to do karate. Where I'm from in Jersey, there were riots back in the 60s. There was definitely a lot of black power, you know, that came about. People wanted to change the circumstances of people of African descent in North. Mary Baraka would be at my house sometimes. They were like all aunts and uncles. They would play African drums and the poetry. And then at some point, you know, us kids would kind of go in the back room. What I had come to realize was, you know, these were Panther meetings that they were having. And of course, my father being a police officer, that was definitely a no-no. And black people do not have this in white America. What is that? The media at large and I suppose white America, the government, they had a different idea of what the, a Black Panther was. Black people must do what for each other? For us, it was us having rights. And we are all what? One. One people. You know, us not being shot dead in the street. And all the little sisters are what? Queen. That's right. When I was a freshman, I went to an all-girls Catholic school. Couldn't afford it, so I transferred to Irvington High which is the school where my mother taught. I remember when we were registering, Dana, they asked if I wanted her in my class. I said, no way, no way. <laughs> Somewhere around 10th grade, I really just started to love hip hop. And I used to leave from Newark with two of my homeboys and we would go to Manhattan. Back then it was much more grungy, a lot more dangerous, but I'm telling you, this was where you wanted to be. There was a club called the Latin Quarters that I used to go to a lot because this is where you would see Eric B and Rakim, Grandmaster Flash with Beastie Boys. You see Run DMC, Karis One. You see Salt Pepper for the first time. You see MC Light. Back then, we all got along. We all hung out. I don't think it happened until later that it was, it's got to be one or none. We're realizing that we could use our voices to make change. My mom was class advisor, and so she would hire the DJs for the parties. You know, when they had fundraisers and stuff, they wanted to go on a class trip, they needed to have a little party, raise some money. And she would hire this DJ named DJ Mark the 45 King, who lived right down the street from the school, but he was from the Bronx, and he had a rep, and he was the guy. Mark the 45 King is a DJ and a record collector of some of the most obscure and funkiest 45 collections. His production at the time was extremely original. I was buying 45s because 12 inches cost more. <laughs> if the record came on 45 and the break was on it, I was getting it. Mark the 45 King in the late 80s was already a big producer on the hip hop scene. My biggest record is 900 number. Mark the 45 King produced Hard Knock Life for Jay-Z and Stan for Eminem. At some point during the day, we all end up at Mark's house, listening to the, you know, the new music or listening to some beats that he was making. Mark, he introduced me to everybody who was sort of the Flavor Unit crew. Flavor Unit! Flavor Unit is mostly friends getting together and can rap their butts off. This was the Flavor Unit from Jersey. It was perfect timing. There wasn't a crew from, from Jersey. So they get in the door immediately because they're put in some place on the map. East Orange is on the map and so is Newark and Irvington, JC. Jersey, period. You know, we trying to stop things and, and, and it's on. You got the Juice crew from Queens. You got BDP from the Bronx. It was like, what's Jersey coming with? Latifah was already my nickname. 
The name Latifah is Arabic and it means delicate and sensitive. You know, I didn't want to be MC because a lot of people were MC this or MC that. I wanted to be different. Queen to me had like a little weight to it. Queen is someone who who walks with their head high. And my mother put a book on my head and made me walk with a book on my head. Gave me a grace and it also gave me a strength. I was getting everybody on the block on the radio because I knew Red Alert. DJ Red Alert is an important tastemaker and DJ for the classic hip-hop generation. He was one of the main house DJs at the Latin Quarter and would famously uh, play an untested record on the audience. And if it worked for the crowd of hip-hop heads at the Latin Quarter, it got instant rotation the next night when he would play uh, Kiss FM on Saturday nights. He played all, no, all, all the flavor you and stuff until Latifah. We went to the studio, we made a, one record, and Red, Red didn't play. He didn't like it too much. He just didn't like it. And then I went home, I remixed it, I put another beat under her. He didn't like that. And I put another beat under her. He didn't like that. Then I gave the same take to Fat Five Freddy. Because I was boys with Fat Five Freddy. Hit me! Go! Your MTV Raps aired in the fall of 1988. And they showed hip-hop videos for a block of an hour on Saturday nights at 10 o'clock. And all of America was watching. MTV, to me, was sort of like television apartheid at the time. And then they made an extremely radical move to go into the most extreme form of American music, hip-hop music. From the moment the show aired, it had the highest ratings in the history of MTV at that point in time. Fat Five Freddy, his greatest gift was that he was a bridge. He was a graffiti artist, a b-boy, but really he was a connector between the have-nots of Uptown, of the Bronx, that aren't allowed into nightlife Manhattan society. Fat Five Freddy is kind of the bridge into the downtown scene with Basquiat, with Andy Warhol. If you were an artist in hip hop that was fortunate enough to get play on MTV, you were golden. We're hanging out in the basement laboratory of DJ Mark the 45 King. And I yo. met Mark, his crew, which was the flavor unit. Do it, Queen. He came into Mark's basement and had us freestyling and explained who we were. Confidence. That's what she exuded. And she was rough in a sense that she was running with a bunch of guys and she would put them in check, but then she was still like an attractive young woman. So it was a very interesting mix. If it wasn't for Fat Five Freddy, I wouldn't have, have gotten a record deal. I played the music for an A&R at Tommy Boy. Dante, Fab Five Freddy, and uh, Mark the 45 King. They were all in my ear about this Latifah. I didn't realize that white people loved hip hop as much, <laughs> as much as she did. Monica was like a hip hop encyclopedia. Tommy Boy was the label. And the fact that the vice president was Monica Lynch. It was a woman who was there and running things and had a voice. So I felt like this was a label that really kind of respected that I was a woman. Next thing I know, Boom, boom, Queen Latifah got signed to Tommy Boy. The first release that Tommy Boy put out for Queen Latifah was a 12-inch single called Wrath of My Madness, back with Princess of the Posse. When I heard the first song, The Wrath of My Madness, I said, who is this? And it just caught my attention. Both those records started to get airplay everywhere. And it was a hit. I was 17, I was a freshman in college, the record started playing on the radio, and I was like, um, people want to book me for shows, so I had to have a talk with my mother. <laughs> I was like, um, mom, do you mind if I just like take a little time off <laughs> from college for a second? I will put 100% into this music thing, and if it does not work out within a year, I promise you I'll go back to school. I ain't been back to school yet. Part of what was motivating Dana was she didn't want to let her mother down with, as far as getting a degree or in the music business. 
Latifah really just wanted to make her mother proud. She was signed, and now she's out there really strong and making an impact. My career was blowing up. I needed a manager. So this is how Dana and I started working together. Dana had a show, and the promoter wouldn't pay her. When you're out there doing these shows and dealing with promoters and having to get paid, you need some muscle. I went and got her money. She was like, well, I got a show in Boston tomorrow. Can you come with me? The guys building the club as we get there had a lot of guys outside of the club doing hand-to-hand drug sales. So I went to the guy and I said, look, man, I know if you give the order, things can get really ugly. Can you do me a favor? Get your stuff together. We'll come back and do a free show for you. But I can't put her in this environment. Get back to Jersey the next day. And I say to her mother, you know what, Miss O, you should manage your daughter. And she said, no, baby, you should manage my daughter. Shaquem loved my mother more than he loved me. You know what I mean? This is his favorite teacher. This is like his mentor, you know? And now he is responsible for her daughter. And he did not take that lightly. We had one office with no windows. (laughs) And we all smoked at the time. (laughs) So it was terrible. It was like Newportsville. It was the worst in the world. There was this huge interest in Queen Latifah from the press. I felt like when I was an up-and-coming rapper, I had to speak for the black community. The images that I saw of us on the news was always something violent. It was always some sort of crime. The images of us in cinema and television, so much of it was us playing the bad guy. We were the robber, we were the mugger, the rapist, the murderer. I realized that I was doing interviews with people who had a story in mind already. Born in the ghetto, mama on drugs, but they made it out. As if every black kid who was a rapper was uneducated and poor and had no parents. I had Princess of the Posse out, had this record called Dance For Me out. My career was going. During this time, we did shows with the Jungle Brothers, and the Jungle Brothers and I, we wound up going on a European tour. When Jungle Brothers went overseas for the first time, they came across a young lady by the name of Mooney Love. Dave Funkenklein said to me, would you be interested in riding with us from London to Milton Keynes tomorrow, which is outside of London? He was the person that was responsible for bringing several U.S. acts to England. I was a city girl from London, from Battersea, and I'm like saying to myself, how do I know? You know how to use a map, yeah? Don't tell this man no. When we met Moni Love in Europe for the first time, she was sort of like the tour guy. We were kind of the two girls around, and she could rhyme her ass off. I was like, stop playing. Like, this girl can spit. Latifah was the running joke on the bus as far as always being the last one on the bus, the last one to wake up. I completely remixed that. She didn't want me to be <laughs> the girl on the tour, but the last one on the bus every time. I crashed on her floor in her room. I got up an hour before she did. She was the first one on the tour bus every day once I started riding their bus with them. So when it came time to make this record, I was like, I definitely want Moni to get down on this. Ladies First was the third single from Queen Latifah's debut album, All Hail the Queen. Mark 45 King told Latifah, come over, we're going to go through some beats. Well, I made the beat up in my house. And almost immediately, Latifah came up with the hook because she started humming. Mm, 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 mm. It's not really boom bap or boom kak or any of that, but it's, it, it might work. And then I took it to Calliope and I tracked it. Clypey Studios was this giant open room, had an 18, 20-foot ceiling, had a small vocal booth in it. After midnight, it was 24 bucks an hour, dollar a track. Yeah, yeah. I knew I want what I wanted to call a song, but I didn't really have a hook, so Mark was like, won't you say, ooh, ladies first? Ooh, ladies first, ladies first. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. I didn't come up with ladies first, ladies first until I heard the bass line. I sang around the bass line. Some of that sounded good. Shane wrote the bass line. Yeah, that's that's it. 
I think I just grabbed some bass sound off a of Roland and dialed it in and sat down to the keyboard. It was a two-bar loop. Just a quick synthesizer sound. It was filling out the low end. He said, hey, will this work? And he liked it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Shane. Mark 45 King came in. Latifah came in. Moni came in. I'm doing my best Latifah impression right now. I want to say something for women. Like, I wanted to uplift women. Being a cool-ass girl who hangs around a lot of dudes, you see women who have low self-esteem, and so they are taken advantage of by men. You see the difference when a woman's self-esteem is high. She makes better decisions for herself. She makes better choices. For me, in my heart, it was anthemic. It was made to be an anthem. It was made to say, ladies, treat yourself like number one. So she was in one side of the studio. I was in the other side of the studio. Just kind of going back and forth, like writing piece by piece. And we were both so excited about this song that we could not get like a whole verse written out each before we were running back to each other like, yo, listen to this. We wrote a lot of stuff together because we were just always together. The ladies who kick it, the rhyme the wicked, those who don't know how to be pros get evicted. I was like, yo, this no! But then she came with like bigger parts. Let me take it from here, queen. It's easy, but I think about it. She's like, yo, this no! If I'm writing something and I'm like, yo, how do you like this part? You'll be like, yeah, but we did the whole session writing four lines each and running back to each other. Oh, add this part to that. What you think about this? And then running back to our pers- respective corners. It was really like a collaborative song. A female rapper with the best scent of free Roxy, but it's a perfect specimen. Can I get some? Sure, Moni Love, grab the mic and get dumb. Yo, praise me not for being to do what I am. Born in Columbia, yo, and South America, you take it back where I'm coming from. They went up in the vocal booth and pretty much slammed them down. We very rarely did any kind of punching in with them. They would just get on the mic and kick it. I just wanted to make music that made women feel like, peace, my sister, what's good, you know? Like, I'm not your enemy. Just those words, ladies first, it holds so much power. It's a state of mind. If you feel like you are number one, then you will not allow somebody to treat you like shit. I think they made that song so that they could prove to others that women and male is the same thing and they're equal any day. A woman can bear you, break you, take you. Now it's time to rhyme. Can you relate to? I love Moni's part. Because when it's time for loving, it's the woman that gives them strong. Stepping, strutting, moving on, rhyming, cutting, and not forgetting. We are the ones that give birth to the new generation of prophets because it's ladies first. She said, yeah, of course, I know you like getting something, but don't forget, I'm bringing forth your next generation. It's like, you know, when Tupac said, we'll have a race of babies that'll hate the ladies, that make the babies. It's like, what are we teaching? It was very uncool to call a woman a bitch. At an early age, I used words that were, you know, questionable. Okay, so that's what I learned from the hood that I come from. But now that I've broadened the scope of what it is that I know, it's my duty to omit what no longer uplifts. Wow. Where did they get this? Oh, you guys got a track sheet. God damn. This is Shane's handwriting. These are the track sheets that we used in every session. Because every session, you know, we had to keep track of what we were doing and where we were putting the sound. October 13th, 1989. There's the tempo. Finally, I've been wondering for years, what the hell is the tempo of Ladies First? Oh, and he scratched the horn cuts. Those things I thought he sampled, I've got it written down as a scratch. So Mark set the turntable up and those things that are going, bow, 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 bow. He scratched those in. <laughs> it's in the Smithsonian. It's on display at the Smithsonian? Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, this um, worksheet was hanging in my bathroom for like maybe 10 years. A lady from the Smithsonian, she came in and she went in my bathroom. Whoa. Well, that's, that's, that's the last place I thought anything that I was involved with would be. I don't know where the hell they put it. It's not just about make money and get out the business. It's about leave something behind that'll carry on. Something more important than money. We just wanted to do something new, I think. A lot of it was really just to try to give a more uplifting kind of vibe to everything. 
everything was up for grabs. It was kind of uh, hip hop's first offspring, the idea of alternative hip hop. The native tongues, which is like the Jungle Brothers, De La Soul, Moni Love, Too Much, Me, and a tribe called Quest. We just wanted to show unity, love. There was a commitment that they had to uplifting the community through hip hop. Positivity flows all through us. You know, we're not into drugs, we're not into gold. The main objective was fighting for equality, but also knowing thyself. Having a sense of self in this socially, politically, sometimes corrupt world that we all live in. Afrocentrism was saying, hey, I'm not just a black American. I'm, I'm of African descent. Got some grand boo-boos here. Ah, the grand Kings boo-boos. and queens only. It was hurting me in America. It's hurting in South Africa. Wherever it's hurting brown people, it's hurting us all. So we could do something about this. Africans were very proud people, you know, and, and I wanted to display that in a modern way. African pendants, a lot of people right in want to know where to get these. Well, this is one of the places. These are beautiful. One of the first videos I directed was uh, talking all that jazz for Stetsa Sonic. They were on Tommy Boy Records, so I had become friends with Tommy Boy. And so Monica Lynch um, hit me up. Hey, Freddie, you want to direct a video? This was a real special moment for me in terms of directing. It was astounding. It opens up with Harriet Tubman, with Sojourner Truth, and Angela Davis. Winnie Mandela. And then, boom, ladies first. I love the fact that we were able to gather all the females of hip hop at that time. That was a Latifah's idea to bring in the other female rappers in the game. MC Peaches, Ice Cream Tea, she got Miss Melody, Missy Me from Canada, Harmony, MC Trouble to come through. Those girls right there were the ones who kind of kicked it off for me. What's sexy about it is the fact that it's not focused on being sexy. Some think that we can't flow. Can't flow. Stereotype, they got to go. Got to go. I'm a mess around and flip the scene into reverse. With what? With a little touch of lace. Being a battle rapper my entire life, there was never no opening door to be friends. So to see sisters being friends, I was happy. I was able to get a lot of females to come to the video that day, but I didn't get everybody. I was asked by Latifah to participate in Ladies First, and at the time, the record label felt, if people want you, they have to buy the record that comes from this label. Being, I think, maybe 17, I went with the the judgment of my management. I remember going to her and saying, do you know how crazy that song would have been if you was on it too? Like, I could bitch slap whoever told you that. The key to that video was finding this collapsed and abandoned pier. We didn't get a, a permit to shoot on the location. The police showed up and they kicked us off because we didn't have permits. That could have been a disaster. And for that video, it was important for me to express what was happening at the time. When you're looking at the news every day, you're seeing a bunch of white people murdering and beating African people in South Africa. It's called apartheid, and we weren't with that. And so our way of affecting that was to talk about it in our records. I grew up in a very conscious household. You know, my father was in the room when Malcolm X was assassinated. I seen them Black Panther newspapers. So I knew about these issues that were going on. And we talked about the fact that we needed to make a statement. So part of the idea of Ladies First is her as a commander of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, which was in full swing. The flavor unit surrounding her, she'd move a piece and knock off one of the cops and put the fist there. And then we intercut that with riot and protest footage, people going up against the South African government. I was able to gather the females in hip hop, show our unity to make change in South Africa.
But I've kept this in my house on display ever since then. When them brothers at the Olympics when I was a kid, like threw their fist in the air, you know, it's symbolic of our struggle, like that we gonna fight and we ain't gonna stop fighting. Really the essence of the video. People still feel the same sense of pride and empowerment upon listening to that song today as they did back in 89. This is still, in this day and age, an anthem. It started with hip hop, which everybody thought was, you know, a super temporary condition. Someone just recently called us and wanted us to, to remake Ladies First, and we said no, because that record could withstand the test of time. You do Ladies First your way, you know, not clean my teeth as well. My career was blowing up. It was a time that I didn't really want to do this anymore. I, I didn't want to go on the road. She just simply grabbed me and said, whatever it is that we want to do, we don't have to do it at this point, but if we want to do it, it's going to be all right. You're young people dealing with label executives. You got your guts, you got your instincts, and you got your brains. But we reading these contracts, and we're just, like, mystified. I was a freshman in college. I was reading everything from cover to cover. And I wasn't really giving her advice as much as I was there to protect her physically from sort of the craziness that happened in hip hop. When people come up to the meetings with me when I would meet mostly with Monica, <laughs> you know. For the first, I would say, year and a half, I would never say anything in a meeting. You know, I would just take notes, and then go ask our lawyer what certain things meant. So I was just studying. He was just a sponge. He was just learning and observing. And at some point, he was ready to speak. And at that point, it was on. Queen Latifah to me means loyalty. I, I think she's the most loyal person I've ever met. So our first mission was to get our boys out of these bad contracts and help them to become successful and help them to become millionaires and change their lives. I went down to the basement one day and I told everybody, I said, look, I'm going to manage y'all or I'm going to bootleg your stuff. Everybody laughed and Apache made a record. The record had a line in it talking about the amateur manager wanted to take us to Canada. We ended up doing the show, everybody got paid, but that was the first show that I ever booked. That's how the flavor unit is. We protect each other and push each other up. That's my posse, my inner circle. Since Ladies First, uh, Queen Latifah has gone on to become an international sweetheart. When you're talking about chivalry and treating a woman with respect, we never wasted anything. The downtime doing the um, making of a video, we would shoot a commercial. She's an award-winning vocalist. After every show, we would sit there, we would go through all the accounting. We were serious. She's hosted daytime talk shows. We always talked about our dreams. And we were teaching each other. It would be the three of us sitting at the kitchen table. And I would share some of what I was learning with her mother, like whether it was about publishing or royalties. The star of television series, sitcoms, an award-winning actress. It was the three of us. That was Flavian, it. And then the shoebox was our office. Queen Latifah gives women reassurance that they can do anything and conquer the world. And she's still an MC who's a, a force to be reckoned with. This is promoting Three Feet High and Rising. Oh, snap. This is dope. This is my mother. I came in for Patti LaBelle. I came out with De La Soul. Rita Owens, Dana's mom, she grounded her. She really was the bedrock. She was our home base. You know, we would go on the road, we would come back home, we would leave the money with her, she put it in the bank. If, the, if anything went wrong, we knew we could call my mother. Her mother was, you know, had a very young, youthful, energetic vibe, great personality. Umi is what we called Latifah's mom. I love my mother more than any woman on the planet. She spoke to me, she taught me how to use language, and she was an artist. When you're in a room with her and you spoke with her, you felt like you were a child, or at the very least, just extremely important. She shaped my thoughts on creativity in a lot of ways and how free you were allowed to think. And then she also taught me how to be a lady. I was a tomboy. When I was ready to try to dress fly, it was my mom who I asked. There's no way that Latifah would be who she is without Umi. To whom much is given, much is required. I hated that one. I had to, like, take this opportunity and not only just keep it for self, but pay it forward with as many people as, as I possibly can. 
We are blessed in some strange way to have culture ooze out of our veins. It pumps through our blood. We can take nothing and turn it into something, something so cool that you want to buy or rip it off. <laughs> but no matter what happens, this is what we're able to do. It's part of who we are. So whether it's music, whether it's writing, whether it's dance, design, mathematics, when we come together for a purpose, we can use our skills, our culture, our abilities to make change. That is what I believe my mom means when she says, to whom much is given, much is required. Who are some of the sisters in your life who ensure that you stay on a certain course, that you're living your best life, that you're being your best self? I'm inspired by my family first, the women who are right around me from my grandmother to my aunts, my cousins, my sisters, my mother. I'm gonna let you take a moment. Sorry. I lost my mother a few months ago, so I'm, I'm sorry to those who don't know why I'm sitting here crying. I lost my biological mother about 10 years ago. I felt like I lost my mother for a second time. Like if you talk to anybody, you talk about Atika's mom, you just kind of see them start glowing. Ms. Owens always had a jewel. You know, in the early days, there was an accountant that stole some money from us, and I was going to go get my money, trust me. And I called her, you know, just to, just to let her know I was sorry for what I was about to do. And, you know, she talked me off the ledge, man. Those are the moments that I would never forget. Like, and, there was, and there's been a lot of those moments over the years, and that's who she was. very strong women in my family. I had smart women, business owners, fighters. I had writers and singers. And my father, the feminist in my family, the male feminist, and who supported the girls in my family, who said, if the boys can do it, she can do it too. Your mother's a flower and her father's a gun. She gets her fearlessness from her father, and she gets her sensitivity from her mother. If you put the two of them together, it's like guns and roses. Latifah was the first woman in hip hop that was political. She was political and she was street. When you start talking about what artists are responsible for, it's a tricky conversation. You have some folks who just don't believe they are responsible. I'm just trying to entertain. Somebody has to take responsibility. Music is such a soother, it's a connector, it teaches. When you have control of something that's that powerful, I would hope that there would be at least a section of people who want to use it for the purpose of opening up dialogue, for the purpose of healing. When you look at the landscape of female rappers, while there's a lot of people who have success, the dignity, the self-respect, the queenliness of Queen Latifah is missing. There's a lot of camera-ready unity that people experience now. I hear a lot of Latifah in Rhapsody. She's not an easy A, B, C, D, you know, Dr. Zeus. She's not one of those MCs. She's very mathematical with her flow. And to me, that screams coming from the family tree of Queen Latifah. I can't take responsibility for the female MCs who came after me. What I can say is that I know I made it okay for a lot of females not being afraid to talk about uplifting themselves, uplifting other females, changing the world. Artists like Latifah, who so gracefully conquered this machine, it's not even fucking designed for them to be a part of it, really, and who are able to do it under the gaze of pop culture, she's really in a league of her own. Every talk show that I've done, I've hired at least 200 people. Every movie, we're talking about 150 to 200 people. I make sure that those people behind that camera look like America. You pass it on, pay it forward. Those things are the legacy that I feel that I've been able to 
be a part of that has let other women know that they can do it too. Just because they saw me do it. Somebody helped me see it, and I feel like I've helped them see it. And I'll leave it at that. From one extra, break out your favourites from years gone by with Throwback Thursday. Download the BBC Sounds app to listen.